people, more than half of the people who were participants, wearing the uniforms, wearing the red mask of the Zapatista front, um, more than half of them had no weapons at all. Many of them carried wooden weapons with knives attached to the end of them. So that it was a badly armed and apparently poorly financed group, but very well organized. You're right. Their ability to take over and to hold seven or eight towns for many days at the beginning of January uh, was an indication of the level of, of sophistication and organization that they had. The most likely impact of NAFTA is to accelerate the process by which Mexicans will move across the border into the United States. And there's really about a hundred to 150 pages of free trade treaty and then almost 2,000 pages of special interest legislation protecting industry after industry. We will not be able to legislate regulations in the state of Texas or in the United States or if we wanted in the city of Austin different from the rules that are set up by this international tribunal in order to restrict the flow of Mexican or Canadian products into Texas or into Austin. We're going to have a gradual overall lowering of wages in the United States, of laboring conditions, of the ability of unions to negotiate because of that constant threat of being able to move a factory into Mexico where you can find high quality, high productivity, low wage workers to replace any group of workers in this country. Just how bad will NAFTA and GATT be? We have an economics professor who is an expert on Latin America, and he's going to tell us all about these two organizations in the first of our two-part series, right now on Alternative Views. Well, we're going to learn an awful lot about NAFTA and GATT and what's happening in Chiapas and the international power structure. In the two-part series, we're going to have a discussion with Mike Conroy. Mike Conroy is an economics professor at the University of Texas at Austin, has been for many years. He's associate chairman of the economics department. And also, he's the director of the Latin American Economic Studies Program. Uh, Mike's going to tell you a lot about NAFTA that you hadn't heard about before. He is an expert in the area of uh, Latin America, particularly Central America, has traveled in these areas that we're talking about, and uh, he has been uh, on a lot of uh, talk shows, radio programs, and has written articles about NAFTA and the problems with it. So we're real fortunate to have you back with us again. Thank you, Frank. The Chiapas uh, uprising is uh, one of the things that's making a lot of uh, headlines right now. What's, now, you've been down through that area. Uh, first of all, what is the area like geographically? Well, Chiapas is, interestingly enough, a geographical continuation to the north, extension to the north, of the mountains of Central America. Uh, people who visualize southern and southeastern Mexico uh, as they would see Yucatan is flat with uh, ancient indigenous pyramids poking out of it. In fact, would find if they went through Oaxaca and into Chiapas that this is very broken, very mountainous, heavily wooded, high pine forests mixed with intermountain valleys uh, with many areas that have only primitive roads going through them. And so if one were to speculate on where within Mexico an indigenous uprising rising might take place, that's tactically the most interesting place for it to occur. 
Now, what is the connection here? That's right next to Guatemala. You suppose there are things going back and forth. There's been an in, uh, uprising of the Indians, uh, the indigenous population for many years in Guatemala. Well, I think, Frank, that the Mexican government would love us to believe that this is nothing but a little outbreak on the Mexican side of the uh, indigenous struggles that have occurred in Guatemala. As you know and as your viewers will know, Guatemala has had the longest sustained uh, indigenous revolt of any of the Central American countries going all the way back to 1953 and 1954. And many of the guerrilla forces working in Guatemala have moved some of their camps and bases of operations into the very rugged area on the Mexican side. And there have been hundreds of thousands of Guatemalan refugees on the Mexican side. But I don't think any of the evidence that we have of the origins and growth of the uh, Zapatista National Liberation Front suggests that it has any ties other than maybe some tactical ties to the guerrilla forces in Guatemala. Now this uprising, this revolution or revolt, whatever term you want to use, seemed to be very highly organized and widespread. So this must have been something that just wasn't very spontaneous. Well, I think in some levels it was very well organized. Uh, the anthropologists and others who have worked down there over the last 10 to 15 years have been filling the electronic mail with uh, accounts of their encounters with these people going back five to ten years. But on the other hand, it isn't nearly as well organized as the Central American insurgencies were in that, for example, more than half of the people who were participants wearing the uniforms, wearing the red mask of the Zapatista front, um, more than half of them had no weapons at all. Many of them carried wooden weapons with knives attached to the end of them. So that it was a badly armed and apparently poorly financed group, but very well organized. You're right, their ability to take over and to hold seven or eight towns for many days at the beginning of January uh, was an indication of the level of, of sophistication and organization that they had. And support of the people, I would assume, also. Most of the people who are in the area and talking to people in the area say that there is considerable support for their fundamental call, for their fundamental proposals. There has been, as usually happens in the mainstream media, much more emphasis on the one or two incidents where villagers rounded up some of the Zapatistas who had few or poor arms and held them in the plazas and beat them up while waiting for the army to get there. Hmm. But um, more of the in-depth reports that are coming out now talk about the fact that we're dealing with a situation which, in which fundamental injustices, especially associated with the indigenous population in Mexico, uh, are breaking out into, into an uprising. I think it's much too early to call it a revolution. It's clearly an uprising. It's clearly a revolt. And it's something that the Mexican government was totally surprised by. Now, I've read reports and also heard on the national public radio that the uh, estimations of the Mexican government that, you know, just a few dozen people have been killed are very, very uh, off base. And that as many as maybe a thousand people have been killed. And is, uh, the Mexican army is still carrying out air raids and artillery attacks against villages and so-called uh, guerrilla strongholds. Well, at this point, three weeks after the uh, initiation of the uprising, uh, there are whole zones of Chiapas where no reporters can go and where there's practically no communication in or out. So we don't really know. Um, I think you're right in saying that most of the more recent reports suggest, and the human rights groups in Chiapas are beginning to build documentation to show that the death toll overall was considerably greater than the official toll being quoted by the Mexican government. But we really don't know, and we won't know until third parties, until the Red Cross, or until the United Nations is able to get people back into the mountains to many of these villages that have been cut off for the whole three weeks. The uh, poverty there is incredible, I understand. This is the equivalent in Mexico of our deep south in the 1950s, of our Appalachia, of our Ozarks. These are terribly impoverished, remote, rural areas who have not, that have not been kept up with the changes that have taken place in the rest of Mexico. Mexico went through very difficult times in the early 1980s. The Mexican economy has been booming since then, but Chiapas isn't feeling that. Chiapas is also separated by the indigenous factor. And 
the gap within Mexico remains enormously large. For the last 50 years, as in pattern which was similar to that of poor Southerners moving to the North mm -hmm. when industrialization took place in the North of the United States after the Second World War, poor Mexican Indians have been moving to the North, towards Puebla, towards Mexico City, and further North, looking for the opportunity, which has, in fact, grown much more rapidly close to the U.S. border. And, of course, that's one of the reasons for the NAFTA involvement mm -hmm. in the whole question of Chiapas. Before we get into NAFTA, I understand that uh, Sotelo, who's the leader of the insurrection, was saying that uh, they just want uh, education, they want uh, opportunities, they want uh, ed uh, food, they want medical help. These want the normal things that people would want. They said that, and here's a quote from a, a, a statement that he had, press conference, we're fed up with the misery and humiliated humiliation inflicted upon us by landlords, the International Timber Corporations, which denude the last remnants of our forest, the corrupt officials who have forgotten what the word justice mean. And they said NAFTA was the last straw. Well, I think that um, it's more important to emphasize the most fundamental sources of their inequality and their poverty, which is the question that's referenced there in terms of their relationship to the landowners and the landlords. These are regions of Mexico, the majority of whose population is indigenous. It's Native American. And just as the non-Native American population in the United States forced Indians in this country off of their land, pushed them further and further back into the mountains, further out into the plains, these people have suffered the same sort of um, difficulties at the hands of the largely Ladino or Mestizo dominant population within Mexico. So this is a portion of Mexico where the indigenous dimension has also had a tremendous link to economic and political power and most fundamental rights. This is the part of Mexico where people who come in and stake a claim to land because the families who haven't been have been living there for 300 years never got official titles to the land are forcing them off of the land. And so their relationship with the local power structure, the local economic structure, um, the local political structure is one of subordination because they're both poor and inarticulate because many of them don't speak Spanish, many of them speak only the indigenous languages, and they have been so isolated in the mountains mm -hmm. that there is no basis for them to obtain justice within the Mexican system. Well, this method you talk about of uh, taking the land away from people is something that's been happening all over the world for uh, Indeed. decades. Indeed. But it's interesting for a person like me who has worked so much in, in Central America over the last 15 years to see how similar the problems of the uh, Tzotzil Indians in uh, uh, southern Mexico are to the Mayan Indians of uh, Guatemala. Um, or of the pipiles in El Salvador at the turn of the century when they were forced off the land by the Ladino population and began the creation of the social tensions which led to the widespread civil war in El Salvador. This is a portion of Mexico which is far more like Central America in terms of social and economic and ethnic characteristics than Mexicans want to have to face. <laughs> Now, we had a couple of programs back about 1978, 1979, in which people, or one person was talking about the uh, uprising of the people in the uh, cities and towns, driving out their local mayors and all that. And another program where a fellow actually spent time with some guerrillas in, uh, I don't know, it was Oaxaca, where it was, mm -hmm. somewhere in this. And uh, they actually had arms, and they would carry out uh, uh, operations against landlords and take some of the... And uh, there were other areas of Mexico where they've had uprisings like that, too. Mm -hmm. How widespread is this type of thing? Well, it's at different levels. Um, this is the portion of Mexico where the left political parties had greater strength during the 1988 elections and led them to take over certain municipalities. When the ruling party forced them out of those municipalities, there were battles, there were many people killed in 1988 and 1989. Comitán is a town in that area that is now back in the news because it's one of the places that is serving as a base for the Mexican army to go out and look for the 
insurgents mm. or the guerrillas in the mountains. So it isn't the first time that the attention of the world has been called to this kind of problem within Mexico. Um, I think it's the brilliance of the stroke that they would start on January 1st on the first day of NAFTA at a moment which is particularly embarrassing to the Mexican government that um, uh, has made it a much more important international and national event than it would have been a month earlier or than it might have been six months later. Uh, I noticed the U.S. Uh, government officials and also the Mexican government just officials said, oh, no, this doesn't have anything to do with NAFTA. And yet, like you say, they started the first day and they admitted it in their interviews that, yes, NAFTA is going to kill us. What effect will NAFTA have on these people? Well, this is a good example that we'll probably be coming back to as we talk more about NAFTA in this discussion. But if you look at what's been happening in Mexico for the last five or six years since Mexico has taken this turn towards a neoliberal conservative free market development policy it has drawn a tremendous amount of foreign investment back into Mexico it has led to the movement of many many factories from the United States into Mexico it has generated many jobs for uh, low wage and uh, low productivity workers as well as low wage high productivity workers in Mexico but almost all of this impact has taken place north of a line that would be drawn through about Puebla. Puebla is a couple hundred kilometers south of Mexico City so from Puebla on north is where all of these new factories have tended to be located and the population to the south of that have felt very little benefit from this new growth process and what they see is that the gap is growing even wider between them and the rest of Mexico and the political resentment about that is something which feeds into the fundamental question of justice that motivates these people with respect to their indigenous rights their economic rights their basic human rights and I understand that NAFTA can have a devastating effect on the small corn farmers that's the key that they're most concerned about and we've known from the very beginning that one of the most devastating potential impacts of NAFTA was going to be its impact on the price of corn. For decades, Mexico has, in a sense, subsidized the smallest farmers in the rural areas by keeping the price of corn inside of Mexico somewhere between 40% and at times up to 70% higher than the international price of corn. Uh, because Mexican corn prices were so high, our big corn farmers in this country have been chomping at the bit to dump their mm -hmm. extra corn, all that corn we've been storing because of government programs in silos here, onto the Mexican market. And that will be great in terms of aiding our big commercial farmers. It's going to be devastating for that large proportion of corn farmers in Mexico who are subsistence level farmers who can just barely make it on the rural land with corn, some of which can be sold at these subsidized prices into the Mexican markets. And one of the big surprises out of the negotiation of the NAFTA treaty was that the Mexicans did not demand more leeway for slowing the rate at which corn prices were going to fall. In fact, they're going to fall very rapidly, and there's very little protection for the Mexican uh, corn producers against that. And the majority of that impact is going to be on those portions of Mexico where the largest number of subsistence farmers are, and that's largely south of Mexico City. And that'll drive them off the land and they'll... Drive them off the land, drive them into the cities, drive them north, drive them towards jobs in the north, drive them beyond the jobs which may or may not be there in the north towards the U.S. border. Mm. And there's another big problem. They've announced that they, uh, that the uh, communal lands on the big ejidos will be uh, sold instead of letting the people work them now. This is a double blow for the poor farmers throughout Mexico. Um, one of the most important changes instituted by the Salinas government in Mexico has been a radical transformation of what's called Article 27 of the Constitution. Article 27 was the portion of the Constitution that created the communal farm system and protected that farm system from outside market pressures, giving the land to the people who had been farming it for hundreds of years, but saying you cannot sell this land, you have to use it for you and your families and other members of your community as a basis for growing and pr prohibiting the sale of that land.
the transformation of Article 27 has now permitted the sale of that land, and what we're finding is that large quantities of that land are being sold to commercial farmers, and hundreds of thousands of peasant farmers are moving off of the land because for the first time they can gain a little bit of income from selling their land, even at dirt cheap prices, to finance their move into the city where they have hope of some better living. Oh, it's a terrible situation. It's yeah. going to be... Well, I remember uh, um, a statement, I forget, was the Minister of Interior, one of the uh, bureaucrats in the uh, Mexican government saying that, okay, if you don't pass NAFTA, we'll, if so that we can export more easily to the United States, we'll just export our people. Well, we may have ended up with uh, <laughs> we'll both that. things occurring. <laughs> yeah. we, uh, we certainly ended up with NAFTA in effect and can expect to see a dramatic increase in exports of Mexico to the United States. But even some of the studies that were done immediately before uh, the passage of NAFTA by people who were supportive of NAFTA, uh, like Tom Espenshade at the Urban Institute in Washington, uh, illustrated that the most likely impact of NAFTA is to accelerate the process by which Mexicans will move across the border into the United States. And the reason for that is very straightforward and, and relatively very simple. The impact on agriculture of moving people out of the countryside because, who can no longer produce at even a minimum system subsistence level because of declining prices for agricultural commodities and other transformations. One of the transformations that few people have talked about in Mexico is parallel to what we have to expect in this country. Large numbers of small factories employing large numbers of people are going to go under as they now compete with the transnational giants that are moving their production from the United States into Mexico using much more capital intensive processes, using much less labor. And where is that labor going to go? Well, maybe into the service sector economy, also very likely that it'll look at the possibility of improving its lot in life by moving north. Along this line, there were in the spotlight, there was an article about this, and it, it uh, indicated the uh, chapter and page and a line where it was talking about this situation, and it was saying that there are provisions in NAFTA that within two years there will not be any citizenship requirements uh, laid upon people who will immigrate. Now, I haven't read the rest of it, uh, looked it up. Does this mean that, this doesn't mean like in, in Europe there's going to be a common citizenship, does it? No, as a matter of fact, um, one of the proposals early eliminated was the notion that we would have free movement of labor across the border. What the clause essentially says is that for professionals, for the better educated, for the already somewhat better off who want to move from the United States into Mexico or Canada or from Canada and U.S. into Mexico, the procedures which previously were very restricted under our general immigration law are going to be greatly facilitated and they're going to have an accelerated process for normalizing their visas if they have a firm willing to vouch for them saying yes this is a uh, especially needed professional available mm -hmm. here it only applies to the professional class oh, to I educated see. people and what many people fear is that this will create a substantial new brain drain out of mexico because we do have a significant demand in this country for the Mexican engineers and software scientists and computer scientists and technicians uh, who are willing to work at significantly lower wages than the people who are being produced in our universities. Mm -hmm. So what we can expect mm -hmm. is an increase in the flow of technical personnel out of Mexico um, because of that particular clause. It does not provide for free movement back and forth across the border, which probably would have been a fairer way of dealing with the gap that exists between these two countries, but obviously it wouldn't have been politically acceptable to the Congress. <laughs> well, let's talk about NAFTA. You've uh, done a lot of uh, radio programs and written articles about the things in NAFTA. I was just utterly amazed at so much about NAFTA that was never mentioned in the media, the regular media, and even by Ross Perot, that fool who got up there. Uh, let's talk about some of the things that they didn't uh, talk about in the media. Well, I think the greatest success of the pro-NAFTA camp in orchestrating the victory of moving it through the Congress in the United States, 
was their ability to deflect attention from the distributive impacts that NAFTA was likely to have. What they did is they forced the debate and couched the debate in terms of the overall benefits and the overall losses probably but not certainly <laughs> going to be gained by each of the three participants and even over that there was tremendous debate but by focusing so much of the debate on whether there would be a 300,000 job gain or a 500,000 job loss in the United States after five years because of NAFTA once they had focused it very much on that particular debate and commissioned lots of studies to analyze that they deflected attention from the fact that whether there's going to be a small net gain in the United States or a small net loss in the United States, there could be enormous distributive implications that were not brought out in any but some articles that a couple of colleagues and I did and debates that we did, but never in the national debates at the, at the top levels. Oh, Let me you, give you an example. Yeah, yeah, give you an example. Um, Vice President Gore, in his debate with uh, Mr. Perot, um, a debate which really was the end of the line for the anti-NAFTA group. Mr. Yeah. Perot uh, was unfortunately so outrageous uh, in ways that were offensive not only to Mexicans but to those of us who work in Mexico and respect Mexico uh, that he also alienated many of the people including Congress people I believe who might have been willing to vote against NAFTA had it not meant that they then had to associate themselves with some of the craziness of his of his presentations. But in that debate, Mr. Gore was arguing there are going to be 200 or 300,000 new jobs in the United States. Mr. Perot was arguing there would be a loss of millions of jobs. Well, that number, the number, a net gain of, say, 300,000, is a number that hides far more than it really reveals. Because you could have, as I fully expect is going to occur, the loss of a million to a million and a half jobs in the poorer portions of the United States, the South, the Southwest, the Southeast, where so many of our workers are low-wage, low-skill, low-education workers with whom Mexicans compete very, very effectively. And if there is a gain in jobs, it's not going to be in those areas. So if you have a million loss in the South and Southeast and the gain of 1,200,000 in the North and Northwest, that's a net gain of 200,000. But the impact upon the Southeast and Southwest is so totally understated by saying there will be a net gain of 200,000 jobs that we're, we're focusing on the wrong dimension. It was easy for the administration later to point out that the economy gains about 11 million jobs and loses about 10 million jobs overall every year. And that tends to be relatively evenly distributed. We're talking about firms that close, factories that close down, uh, factories that move. And if a factory moves out of Texas and goes to the north, that's a loss of jobs in Texas and a gain of jobs in the north. But we have about a $10 million churning, 10 million person churning in our labor force every year. So an addition of 200,000 is minuscule by comparison. Mm -hmm. But what it doesn't point out is that we're going to have certain industries the textile industry, the yes. apparel industry, yeah, the auto parts industry, the food processing industry are going to be moving much more rapidly to Mexico than they were from 1988 to 1992, 1993 already. Mm -hmm. We saw a massive movement of those industries into Mexico and now they have many reasons for accelerating that process, affecting specific regions of the country. Chicken processing, it's a nasty business. It happens to be one of the businesses on the basis of which Mr. Clinton built up the economy of Arkansas, but that part of the Arkansas economy is now severely threatened by the ability of those same um, patriotic U.S. chicken packers to move to Mexico and ship the chickens back across the border now with no tariff. Chicken packing is an industry that requires very close scrutiny by state and local government for occupational safety and environmental reasons to the extent that people in places like North Carolina and South Carolina and Arkansas have been increasing the scrutiny of occupational safety and environmental conditions, they're heading south. Where, <coughs> where even though there may be good laws in Mexico, they're not enforced. Well, in the particular case of occupational <coughs> safety, there aren't good laws in yeah. Mexico. Um, there aren't good right to work laws or, or worker protection oh, yeah, laws. The unionization is more often than not a sweetheart union that's mm -hmm. associated with the, the ruling party. 
um, and the environmental laws. Um, that the definition and the argument about environmental law is a, is a much more complicated one than was dealt with in the debate here in the country. But even there, there are economic advantages of fulfilling to the expectation of Mexican law the environmental conditions down there, which give them an advantage even over poor rural areas of Arkansas, poor rural areas of North Carolina. So those industries are the ones that are going to be devastated. And it isn't a situation where you take a 45-year-old, semi-literate, um, white uh, woman sewing in a factory in rural North Carolina that you're going to say, fine, now that we have a new job opening up in the computer industry in the Northwest, <laughs> we're going to move you to it, right? Yeah. Even if we had programs to do it, which we don't, even if we had programs to do it, this person isn't going to be qualified for the jobs that are going to be created. And they wouldn't want to leave the place where they live. They, they probably wouldn't want to. And... But what they're going to have to do then is to pay the cost and the consequences of this international agreement, which undermines their lifetime of building expectations mm. about being able to live out their lives close to their families in the communities where they grew up. But nobody talked about those distributional impacts other than a few of us. And there was another subject which you mentioned, and that is uh, they talk about free trade, and yet, what, a thousand pages of protectionism in the agreement? Right. I, I think the best characterization of it was by some pro NAFTA people saying there's really about a hundred to 150 pages of free trade treaty, and then almost 2,000 pages of special interest legislation protecting industry after industry. I mean, the whole process, Frank, by which that treaty was drafted, where the Bush administration brought together about 500 advisors, 95% of whom came out of the industries that were going to be affected and allowed them to sit down with a counterpart group in Mexico saying, all right, guys, fight it out. How are you <laughs> going to work out industry by industry the best possible package for you and your industry? What this has given us is a situation where there are outrageous protectionist clauses in the treaty as it was passed, giving benefits to those specific industries that were able to push through what they most wanted to do. Concrete example. Um, it is now required that, as part of the content requirements for televisions that are manufactured inside of the North American Free Trade Agreement, that one specific component, the general rules are a certain proportion have to be made locally, but they specifically put in saying that the picture screen has to be manufactured in the Mexico, the U.S., or Canada. Well, almost all of our pictures uh, tubes have been brought in from Japan, from Taiwan, from Korea. And what this is is a tremendous boon to the U.S. picture tube manufacturing industry, which is now opening plants in Mexico to produce for the newly protected North American market for picture tubes for the televisions that are considered. There are dozens of examples like that all the way through the treaty. And I tended to call it, and you've heard me on some of these radio programs call it the uh, uh, North American Special Protection <laughs> Agreement rather than the North American F Free Trade Agreement. And in, then in order to bribe enough Congress people to get them to pass this thing, they had to hand out what uh, the nation has said um, uh, enough bribes in the way of protections and other special considerations, something which may cost the taxpayers as much fifty billion dollars just to get this thing passed. It was ironic because a lot of the special deals that were cut during the last three or four days of negotiation were things that in fact violated the North American Free Trade Agreement. Yeah. Concrete example, <laughs> um, the sugar industry in, Cal in Florida and in Colorado. The sugar cane industry in Florida, the sugar beet industry in Colorado were adamantly opposed to the Free Trade Agreement because they fully expected that Mexico would dump large quantities of sugar into the U.S. at substantially lower prices and then Mexico would replace its sugar with sugar they could get relatively easily from Cuba. So this Cuban connection was something that the sugar industry was hollering and screaming about. Well, one of the things that uh, Mr. Clinton agreed to, even though it technically requires a modification of the treaty that the Canadians and the Mexicans were willing to overlook, was to say to the uh, Florida and Colorado sugar producers, we are simply going to not follow the terms that are specified in the treaty for a minimum of five years, and then only phase in very slowly what changes are going to be uh, phased in for the sugar industry, even though the sugar industry clause was quite different in the treaty. So this was supposed to be fast track. This was supposed <laughs> to be yes or no on the treaty as it was. Yeah. And when it came down to getting the last few votes, they made changes in the treaty, by agreeing somehow 
to block the imports of sugar for another five years, protecting that special industry and simultaneously calming the fears of the Cuban-American community in Miami that Cuban sugar was going to indirectly come in through Mexico. Mm. To me, one of the most <clears throat> absolutely censored never mentioned in any of the news broadcasts I ever heard or any of the debates, and that is the absolute, uh, could be the destruction of economic democracy or even our democracy, and that is these resolution uh, dispute panels and tribunals, these secret things that uh, were, are in the treaty, not talked about. Can you tell us about those? Well, they still have to be formulated. One of the things you've got to realize about the free trade agreement was in order to get it through, and in order to get it through without having to take the time to work out all of the details that, for example, the European community took 28 years to work out, the creation and staffing and organization of all these panels, the treaty simply says there will be a resolution dispute panel and it provides some minimum detail on how one has to approach these if there is a dispute. But as things stand right now, if you are a small producer of a product in Central Texas, uh, in the Northeastern United States, in the Northwestern United States, and suddenly found yourself being inundated by Canadian or Mexican products that you were certain they were dumping into our markets, the dispute mechanism doesn't exist. It isn't clear who you go to in order to call for some uh, new intervention to stop that dumping. And gradually they're going to be created, but they don't even have bylaws. It doesn't, we don't know what the composition is going to be. We don't know how they're going to be named. But the most important details of our trading relations among these three countries are going to be resolved by these panels, and we don't know yet who's going to form them, how they're going to be formed, what participation, if any, we will have democratically in them, other than the fact that presumably there's going to have to be some agreement between the ruling administrations in all three countries about their composition at some point in time. Uh, but it is, it is a, uh, an elimination of much of the authority that Congress previously had for making these determinations and making these decisions and passing them on to international tribunals over which... Um, uh, we, we can't even claim to know how we're going to exercise some control because we don't know what the composition of them or their structure is going to be. Now, the uh, Multinational Monitor has uh, a whole edition on NAFTA, and it has uh, one uh, or two pages on, uh, on these uh, tribunals, and it talks about, uh, you know, all the procedure to go about it. Mainly, it's to keep the ordinary person or uh, public interest groups keep their noses out of the situation. But as I understand it, these tribunals would have the authority to, in effect, strike down any local, state, or national law which the companies or the national governments claim will be <clears throat> an impediment to trade. And some of these things have already, uh, under GATT, for instance, have been uh, uh, challenged. And, uh, the, the uh, for instance, they forced cigarettes on Thailand. Thailand was wanting to, uh, uh, was concerned about the health of their people, and so they said, okay, we're not going to import cigarettes. But the tribunal, the GATT people said, oh, oh you got to, that's an impediment to trade, a barrier to trade, and so now Thailand has to take uh, cigarettes. And so they could conceivably... <coughs> Uh, strike them down in the sense that I mean, all, they, they can fine countries or they can have uh, uh, retribution with the other trading partners uh, against that particular country that uh, has this, uh, what they consider an offense. And it's all done in secret by these panels which are, uh, uh, you know, pro-business uh, to start out with. This can have far-reaching consequences for democracy. Well, I think it where I find it more, most threatening has to do with the kinds of grassroots democracy um, that in this country, for example, has been the strongest basis for the evolution and growth of the environmental movement. It's a very severe threat to the ability of unions to negotiate improved conditions for their own workers. It's a serious threat to the fundamental rules, and what we're really talking about here are the rules that we use for allowing goods to cross the border. What NAFTA does for these three countries, what GATT does for the world, and we can talk about GATT later because it's actually a little more frightening with mm -hmm. GATT, 
What NAFTA does for these three countries is sets a basic set of ground rules that will be abided by by all three partners, minimizing the conditions under which you can stop the movement of a product from one country to another. Now, part of the ploy that's been used is to say, if you're against GATT, you're obviously a protectionist, and if you're a protectionist, <laughs> there's something wrong with you. But even that hasn't been dealt with appropriately. We deliberately choose to protect ourselves. This week, the Clinton administration is arguing in China that we are going to protect ourselves from products produced by prison labor in Chinese prisons. And yet we have prison labor here in the United States. <laughs> we have prison labor in, the, yeah. in this country, and we're not necessarily talking about the implications. Yeah. But we do choose not to allow products that have certain characteristics to cross the border. We don't allow products that have certain kinds of residue chemicals on them to cross the border. When we talk about GATT a little bit later, that's a, uh, a very critical point in GATT that is exactly along the lines of what you're talking about. We will not be able to legislate regulations in the state of Texas or in the United States, or if we want it in the city of Austin, different from the rules that are set up by this international tribunal in order to restrict the flow of Mexican or Canadian products into Texas or into Austin. Now, you might say that's fine, that increases the flow of goods, but for years the environmental movement in California, for example, has been way ahead of the environmental movement nationwide. And for their own reasons, Californians have required higher levels of environmental controls on automobiles. That's not going to be allowed any longer. Yeah. Communities in other states have required higher levels of, of uh, inspection of products crossing from one state to another. That's not going to be allowed either, because if a product goes from Mexico into Arizona and is stopped at the border of California as it's crossing from Arizona, that will be interpreted as a restraint on trade from Mexico. So we are going to find ourselves with this homogenizing of regulations, not necessarily at the level that we as a nation or we as a state or we as a city or we as a county might choose to use for ourselves, we're going to be bound by these internationally homogeneous groups. If it's difficult enough for us now to get Congress to pass in a new environmental control law, imagine how difficult it's going to be for us to have to convince the Congress and then convince the Congress to go to the International Tribunal and then to get people in Canada and Mexico also to organize to go to the International Tribunal to make one major or one minor change in environmental regulations. Mm. That's the way in which our grassroots ability to affect what's happening around us is seriously undercut. There's another thing that hadn't been talked about in the media, and, or just mentioned perhaps, so in passing, and that's the uh, uh, Regional Development Bank, which, as I understand, is supposed to help get this thing started and to build infrastructure and to help uh, clean up the mess the Maquiladoras have left. Can you tell us about that? Well. One of the concerns, especially raised by some courageous Hispanic legislators, uh, Stephen Flores, especially out of California, uh, was almost single-handedly responsible for this, um, was a concern that much of the burden of the adjustment, much of the burden of the additional cost, much of the burden of the further deterioration of the U.S.-Mexican border it was going to be borne by the Hispanic population in this area, and they insisted on some sort of a program. It ultimately is going to be called the North American Development Bank, mm -hmm. NADB, um, as a basis for providing the loans needed to fund the activities of adjusting. But this raises the much bigger question. That bank was agreed to, in principle, with an initial capitalization of about $250 million. Yeah. That is a drop in the bucket in terms of the overall adjustment costs that these three nations are going to face. And let me give you a counterexample. There's only been one successful long-term integration of economies similar to what we're trying to do with NAFTA, and that's the European community. Now, they started in 1958 and only in 1992, what is that, 34 years later, finally 
joined all of their programs together and created what, what, what was a complete European Union. In fact, they call themselves now the European mm -hmm. Union, which allows free flow of goods, free flow of capital, free flow of people across all the boundaries of these countries. But look what they've had to do in order to adjust to and assist countries to adjust to it. From the very beginning, they recognized there were going to be regions negatively affected, workers put out of work, factories closed down, and so they created two major European programs, the European Development Fund and the European Social Fund. The European Development Fund is used to assist those communities that lose their factories to search for another factory, to provide some subsidies, the location of a new factory, to develop a new industry, to find new technology, to create the jobs so that people can get back to work after the factory closes because it moves from Germany to Spain or from Spain to Germany within the European Union. Now, 34 years later, they have continued to increase every year the amount they spend on those adjustment programs. Mm. They are spending in 1993-94, in their fiscal year, more than $8 billion, 34 years into the adjustment wow. program. They have spent a total of hundreds of billions of dollars helping communities adjust to all of the impacts that the integration is designed to have. We recognize that we're supposed to have significant changes in our economies. We're supposed to get a leaner and meaner U.S. economy, <laughs> a leaner and fatter or fatter and meaner Mexican economy, a Canadian economy, which is more rationalized. But this means closing factories and opening plants. It means closing some jobs down, retraining people here. We have not created anything other than this tiny little $250 million border development bank as a basis for adjustment. It's nothing. As an economist, now, what's the difference with an economic union, a European union, uh, with joining uh, people like France and Germany with uh, economies like uh, Italy and Spain, but the United States and Canada joining a, what's in fact a third world country, or at least maybe a half a third world country, almost uh, a little bit more than that, Mexico, that's an enormous gap. Right. There's never been a successful economic integration between countries with as large a gap as exists between the United States and Mexico. The way the administration countered that suggestion was for the early trade negotiator Carla Hills, as well as President Salinas when he visited here in Austin two years ago, saying, yes, but in the European <laughs> Union, the gap between West Germany and Portugal was about the same as the gap between Mexico and the United States. Uh, it was a very good suggestion, it was a good try, but it was wrong. First of all, because it wasn't just Portugal joining with West Germany. In 1986, which is the last major expansion of the European Union, European Economic Community, it was Spain and Portugal joining 11 other nations. And when you compare the standard of living in Spain and Portugal to the average standard of living in 11 other nations, they had already about 60% of the standard of living of the rest. And so the gap was between one, that were, or one region that was 60% of the whole and others at various levels. The Mexican economy compared to the U.S. and Canadian economies has a standard of living under the most favorable terms of analysis. And we did the analysis here in Texas. Under the most favorable terms, about 23 to 24% of the level of development of the United States and Canada. We've never had a successful integration of economies like that. So we should expect really serious changes, larger changes than they were expecting in the European economic community. Therefore, we should expect to need greater adjustment funds. And these are some of the arguments that Mr. Perot should have been using on a more reasonable basis in his debate with the Vice President Gore, but he got distracted. <laughs> what about the, uh, the some, some of the l perhaps less significant things, but still things that could happen, like the uh, safety and licensing requirements of trucks and drivers coming across and the, uh, there was a big article here in, in the Austin Statesman, American Statesman about the drug lords uh, buying up trucking lines and uh, uh, warehouses on the Mexican border because all the goodies they can now come in uh, much more easily because of NAFTA. Uh, if we aren't able to deal with our drug problem other than by building some sort of an anti-drug barrier at that border, NAFTA is going to lessen our ability to control it. If the only way we can keep drugs out is to stop them from crossing the border, 
with these radar balloons and with aircraft chasing aircraft and with uh, all the high-tech stuff along the ground, um, NAFTA is going to make it much easier to get drugs across. Not because necessarily the drug lords are buying trucking lines, but because the flow of traffic is going to double and triple. And because in order to get that traffic across, the bridges and the roads that we have right now, everyone is saying we have to make the customs more efficient, we have to inspect fewer of the trucks, we have to have better paperwork, we have to trust more of the stuff coming across, have, factory, have trucks closed up as they leave the factory and not reopened until they get to a factory up here in the north. Um, all of that is going to increase the ability of diligent drug traffickers to move large quantities of drugs across the border much more easily than they have in the past. Alternatively, we could increase the amount of surveillance and put whole divisions of the military down along the border, as certain political candidates are now proposing. <laughs> Stop every truck for a half an hour to two hours, unload it, inspect it for drugs, load it up and move it across again. But the howls and screams that you'll get from the business people because of the slowing down of the crossing of the border will make that impossible. It is going to be easier to cross the border, and that means it's going to be easier for drugs to cross the border. But that's also simply a reflection of the fact that the solution to our drug problem is not stopping the movement of drugs across the border. It's reducing the demand and changing the focus in this country, which changing the social conditions which lead people to turn to drugs. Another category of concern and contention are licensing of professionals. Now, can uh, the uh, Mexicans who want to come up here, for instance, and uh, be doctors or dentists or lawyers, can they go to one of these tribunals and say, hey, the requirements for getting a license uh, to uh, practice in the United States are too onerous, it's a restraint of trade, and so uh, our requirements will have to be lessened to meet those? Um, there is going to be some harmonization of that. Um, but I'm actually less concerned about that than I am about many other characteristics of it. Uh, in fact, the quality of the training of Mexican professionals is very, very high. I don't think we need to worry about the quality of the physicians that come out of the Mexican schools of medicine. The principal reason that people will go to, Mexican to Mexico to study medicine rather than stay in the United States is the American Medical Association restricts the supply of doctors in order to keep doctors' wages high by lessening the number of people or limiting the number of people who can get into medical schools. And there are lots of very, very good people who then turn to Mexico and other countries for their training. More importantly, the quality of the training makes these people very, very competitive with workers in the United States. And if they can't find ways of getting into the United States to work under wage scales that are typical of the United States, they will go to work in factories in Mexico where they'll work for substantially less in the software industry, in the computer mm -hmm. industry, in the design industry, in the advertising industry, and in biomedical industries, that's likely to take place. Um, I'm not worried about the quality of the workers coming across. What I'm worried about is that the fact that you have such very high productivity, high quality workers in Mexico, who because of a variety of conditions in their labor markets, work for half or less of what comparable people work for in the United States. Mm -hmm. I heard one person say, uh, Doug Kellner, our friend Doug Kellner, said that he thought that the passage of NAFTA was Bill Clinton's big and first litmus test with the American power structure and ruling class. That even though he could uh, be wishy-washy and a wimp and uh, compromise uh, so much on things that might affect the people, they were really playing hardball to get this thing passed. This was a supremely important thing. Well, when David Rockefeller comes on TV and starts talking about yeah. it, you know that they're really concerned. Well, I think that there's no question mm. that conservative business interests, and especially the transnational corporate interests, wanted NAFTA very, very badly. And the fact of the matter is that Mr. Clinton's coalition was a coalition of labor environmentalists, women, minorities, and conservative democratic business interests. The one thing which the conservative democratic business interests demanded of him as a precondition for their support in his election was his support of NAFTA. And it is something which is going to tear that coalition apart to some extent and has already torn the coalition apart. The severance of his ties with labor is going to be costly to him later on when he wants their support on other issues. But what it was was a moment in which the business community, the transnational business community, really represented by and led by Secretary of Treasury Benson, 
who was the most pro-NAFTA member in the whole Clinton administration, pushed this through as something which they absolutely had to do if they didn't want to completely alienate the business community. And it makes sense that the business community would push for it. This free trade agreement is a big business free trade agreement. It's a free trade agreement which is going to hurt small business, it's going to hurt local business. It's very, very good for those corporations that are large enough to produce in both places, to market in both places, to combine their production facilities so that components are made in Mexico, components are made in the United States, assembly takes place one way, place or another, and then they ship to the rest of the world. Little firms can't do that. So it's the big firms that gain a significant advantage from getting this new access to Mexican labor, much more important than getting new access to Mexican markets, because the Mexican market relative to the U.S. market is still only 10 or 15 percent of the U.S. market. So what they really wanted access to was Mexican regulations, Mexican labor, and the real reason that the unions really had to oppose it, had no choice but to oppose it, was that this gives every major factory, every major firm, in every labor union negotiation, the ability to say, if you don't give us the concessions that we want, you can threaten to strike all you want, and all we're going to do is move our factory to Mexico. We're going to have a gradual, overall lowering of wages in the United States, of laboring conditions, of the ability of unions to negotiate because of that constant threat of being able to move a factory into Mexico where you can find high quality, high productivity, low wage workers to replace any group of workers in this country. So it looks like the uh, condition of the American standard of living is going to worsen and worsen and worsen at a time when it's already at the lowest level in uh, decades. No, the liberalization that has taken place under Reagan and Bush has already forced the real earnings of families in this country down for almost 20 years straight. It began in 1973 and it's continued coming down. What it'll certainly do is it will eliminate some of the possibilities that we would have had for higher standards of living. It isn't going to push U.S. wages suddenly to the level of Mexican wages, but it's going to eliminate many of the opportunities that we might have had to raise wages in this country. More importantly, and this I think is, is the bottom line argument for me in terms of NAFTA, it gives all the wrong signals to firms that use American workers. There are two alternative future roads that American industry could follow. It could follow the road that the Europeans and the Japanese have been following, which is a high road, high productivity, high skill levels, enabling them to pay high wages for the production of world-class goods. And the good safety net social services. With a good set of so mm -hmm. uh, social services paid for out of that high level of productivity and the taxation that comes off of it. There is another road, which I call the low road, and that's the road of saying we can also produce the same products using labor-intensive processes with low productivity, low skill workers, where rather than pay for high productivity workers whom we have to train and retain and keep and work with using the latest of uh, high-tech uh, machinery, we're going to go with a low-tech solution and we're going to outcompete the Mexicans, we're going to outcompete the Koreans, we're going to outcompete the Brazilians by getting our wage costs down even lower and using what are essentially third world production processes. By opening the door to Mexico, we're allowing many more U.S. firms to say, I can now supply the U.S. market using the low road strategy, whereas previously they would have given much more serious thought to taking the high road strategy, investing in their workers, raising their productivity, and being able to pay higher wages. This has been the first of our two-part series on NAFTA and GATT, the things which the regular media and the politicians didn't tell you. We'd like to thank our crew who helped make the program possible. Brian Lynch, Trish Busa, Itza Gutierrez, 